Hello, and thank you for joining us in a new episode of the Weekly Defence Podcast. I'm Ben Vogel, News Editor here at Shepherd Media. And coming up on the show this week, we talk to BAE Systems Heglands about its midlife upgrade of CV90 combat vehicles, followed by a chat to Swedish network security company Clavista about their recent agreement with BAE Systems Heglands to develop cyber technology for the CV90. I'm joined in our virtual studio by air editor Tim Martin and land reporter Flavia Camargos Pereira. Hello, both of you. Hello. Hi, Ben. I'll come to you guys in a minute to discuss some stories from the air and land desks. But first, let's take a look at some of the other headlines from this week. And we start in Europe where the Belgian air component has been forced to ground its entire F-16 fleet for urgent checks following an incident last month when an aircraft experienced pipe burn problems with its engine after takeoff. An investigation found that several engines are likely to present the same problem and the Belgian MOD announced on the 9th of March that the entire F-16 fleet will be, quote, immobilised pending results. Whether other countries are experiencing the same problem is currently under investigation, the MOD added. On to the States now, where the US Army has conducted a successful 80 kilometer flight demonstration of the Extended Range Guided Multiple Launch Rocket System. An extended range munition was fired at White Sands Missile Range from a high mobility artillery rocket system launcher. The demonstration confirmed the missile's flight trajectory, range and validated interfaces with a HIMARS launcher and system software, manufacturer Lockheed Martin announced. The baseline GMLRS has a maximum range of 70 kilometres, according to Shepard Defence Insight. And also in the United States, Lockheed Martin has received a $7.83 million contract from DARPA, for Phase 1 design work on the Longshot program. This contract provides research, development and demonstration funds for the futuristic air-launched UAV that is envisaged to be capable of firing multiple air-to-air weapons from standoff range. Work will be completed by February 2022 at three US locations. And it's also worth mentioning that Lockheed is one of three US companies to receive long-shot Phase 1 funding from DARPA, the others being General Atomics and Northrop Grumman. And, after repeated false starts, the first booster test flight of the AGM-183A air-launched rapid response weapon, or ARROW, is scheduled for later this month. Work is underway on pre-flight ground tests and checks to obtain certification for the flight to proceed as scheduled the US Air Force announced last Thursday. The first booster test flight of the hypersonic weapon was originally scheduled for December 2020 before being pushed back to the first week of March 2021. No no official explanation has been given as to why the test launch has been repeatedly delayed. Those were just some of the news stories we've run in recent days. Time now for some in-depth views from our domain editors, And let's go to the air desk first. And Tim, this week you reported on the intriguing possibility of the Israeli Air Force F-35 basing um, jets being based in the Gulf states. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, Ben. Uh, of course, it is quite an, an interesting story. Um, uh, politically, you know, you wouldn't have expected something like this to, to happen, um, you know, given the, the tension um previously before the signing of Abraham Accords between uh, Israel, the UAE and Bahrain, which have kind of smoothed over um, years of uh, political uh, tension, let's say, and uh, instability. Um, And so uh, I was speaking to a defense analyst and he was suggesting that there is definitely a a possibility that uh, Israeli F-35s in the future um, could fly from uh, air bases in the UAE and Saudi Arabia um, and they would be potentially around an hour away from um, striking uh, Iranian nuclear sites. Um, And of course, that is the strategically, that would be 
uh, very significant uh, and rep- represents something of a, a step change when it comes to um, Israeli strategy, I would suggest, um, in terms of countering uh, Iran. Um, so yeah, that that that's kind of the the headline on on those types of developments. Um, they're caveated, I suppose, uh, with the fact that um, the UAE still doesn't have any uh, F-35s, of course. Um, they've been approved. Uh, they're subject to a review at the moment um, on the, the US government side. Um, but they would become, you know, the, the second uh, behind Israel, they would become the, the second country in the region with uh, with the aircraft. Um, so, you know, there are things that have to take place um, before uh, the possibility of, of Israeli F-35s, you know, um, being flown from Gulf soil, let's say, um, would happen. But but clearly an, an interesting development that even, you know, this is being, being said publicly from, from an analyst uh, at this stage. I, I don't think in, you know, even two, three years ago, you, you would have you would have heard with such conviction this type of thing being said. Yes, clearly it would be an extremely significant development in the, in the, in the defence uh, geopolitics of the region. Um, how clear are the funding aspects, especially as the F-35 is just one of a number of US-made aircraft the Israelis are, are buying or are interested in buying? Yeah, so, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the fundamentals behind the, the funding is, of course, uh, that uh, the US heavily back... Um, Israel with uh, defense funding, and that's through the uh, foreign um, military financing um, mechanism uh, that, that they have in place. So year on year, roughly, the US will commit to uh, 3.5 to 3.8 billion um, in, in military aid uh, to Israel. Um, so yeah, the the I was looking through the Congressional Service, Congressional Research Service, um who kind of detail, you know, some of the, the colour behind the funding. Um, and so, yeah, they were saying that in FY 2021, the Trump administration requested uh, $330 uh, million for Israel and on top of that, uh, $500 uh, million, um, for missile defence. Um, so, yeah, not only with the F-35s is there financial support uh, from the US for Israel, is it guaranteed, but also with... Um, uh, other acquisitions, um, namely the, the KC forty six, um, eight of which have been approved uh, in recent weeks, and also um, the Israeli uh, Defense Minister Benny Gantz announced on the twenty fifth of uh, February that Israel would select the CH fifty three K King Stallion, which is the heavy lift, the the in development U.S. Marine Corps uh, new heavy lift uh, aircraft. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a a spate of acquisitions in the last number of weeks uh, that that Israel have committed to. On the F-35, of course, they're looking at um, buying a third squadron. Um, So so that's that. But, I mean, really on, I suppose, if I can just quote the the analyst in terms of, just to give a a fairly clear indication of of how funding looks, he said, as far as I understand, the deals for the F-35, KC-46 and the CH-53K are to the tune of roughly 9 billion Israeli shekels or $2.7 billion, which comes from the, the 3.8 billion of military aid um, that the US gives uh, Israel uh, each year. And, and that's, as I just say, a reference to uh, FMF um, commitments from um, from the US. Um, but, he, but he did also mention that there, there are big difficulties over pay, payments on the Israeli side. And he said paying up front will be difficult due to the defense budget in Israel and the orders require major loans from American banks, uh, which will cost the Israeli government hundreds of millions of shekels uh, in interest. So, you know, I think that's quite interesting to, to flag up in terms of putting a bit of color behind uh, all of this. Um, you know, it's it's not just as plain sailing as you, you might think or were led to believe um, that uh, in terms of, you know, Israel just having the best of both worlds in some senses um, that they have, you know, their own pot of money to spend and also they'll be heavily backed by finance and from the US. It's it's not just as, as easy as that, you know. There is uh, interest considerations to be thought about and, and borrowing from American banks. 
Indeed, it's it's not quite so much of a, a blank check as, as as some people think. Um, you mentioned the the third F thirty five squadron that the Israelis are interested in buying. Um, can you give any uh, kind of update as to progress on that score? Is it still just a pipe dream, or? Um, yeah, so on the, on on the third uh, squadron, yeah, the, the Israeli government have committed to it. Um, so it has to be obviously the, the U.S. government will have to go forward with with pushing it through. But yeah, the the that commitment's been certainly been made now, and uh, the there will be of course a new election uh, in Israel on the twenty third of March, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so politically, things you know could could change and. You know, you might have delays on that front, um, but but as things stand, uh, yeah, it's on. It's it's over to the U.S. government then, really, to to make progress on, on the third squadron. And um, I should also point out that I think with the third squadron, it, it's quite uh, interesting, um, and also the uh, given what's been said by the defense analyst of operating from um, Gulf states, uh, just to consider the fact that at an operational uh, level, the the two squadrons that Israel have at the moment uh, are operated from Nevatim Air Base in southern Israel. So, you know, they can feasibly strike positions in Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, and, and even parts of Egypt. Uh, and that's without uh, any aerial refueling. So, you know, think about, um, you know, think about uh, Iran and being able to... Um, strike at targets uh, if you are based on Gulf soil um, without, ha- you know, an hour away would mean that you don't have to uh, do any refueling or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So um, I-, I think that's that's possibly but the thinking on a uh, Banner Third Squadron as well. You know, it obviously increases uh, combat mass as well. And um, now obviously I'm talking about um, more serious scenarios and, you know, if there's any state on state attacks and things like that, you know, that they, they, these are the areas that, that really I'm, I'm talking about. Um, and, and, you know, at, at the moment, from an Israeli perspective, they are uh, in the middle of a campaign between, between the wars, uh, as it's called. Indeed. Thank you very much, Tim. And uh, this is A very interesting story. I recommend uh, all our listeners uh, log on to Shepherd Media and read it. Let's take a look at the land news now. And Flavia, a story from you about the Czech Republic being set to become the first of the so-called new NATO countries to operate an agency to promote national military exports at government to government level. Give us the details. Yeah, actually, the the Czech Republic ban has approved the creation of the Intergovernmental Defense Cooperation Agency. It's called AMOS, and it will promote sales of military equipment at the uh, state-to-state level. Uh, This agency is intended to support national defense companies and and provide uh, liaison between them and foreign states. Uh, the Czech Republic, as you said, will be the first country in Central and Eastern Europe to operate an agency like Amos. I mean, an agency uh, to promote national military exports at the state to to state uh, level. So uh, Amos has been announced. Clearly, the Czechs are, are you know, intent on 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 setting this up, but. Um, is there any idea of when Amos is set to start operations? Actually, Amos will start operations on 15 of March. It means next week. And uh, this agency will be part of the National Ministry of Defense. But it will work as an independent unit. It will guarantee... Uh, the technical quality of the the defense equipment produced in in Czech Republic, uh, and they will do this via a national certification authority. In this case, it will be the Military Technical Institute, uh, which is a state-owned enterprise, and Amos will also propose uh, appropriated solutions for contract requirements. It'll be a way to support the the national companies and national industry, I mean, the, the defense industry in the country. 
so the main aim here is to uh, sort of lay a pathway for defence exporters to uh, gain more business abroad, I suppose. Uh, yeah, to, to be honest, the primary the primary goal of the AMOS is not to increase uh, military exports. Uh, currently, the Czech defense companies uh, sell up to 90% of their products to other countries. And the, the MOD, the Czech MOD, noted that um, there is an increase in demand at the... Um, intergovernmental level for Czech-made uh, military military equipment. Uh, in fact, this in the, this this agents is intended to support uh, national companies uh, with state guarantees and certifications. In this sense, uh, its goal is to provide the Czech industry with a, a better chance to succeed in foreign markets. Uh, I mean. There were um, recent instances uh, in which AMOs may have been beneficial for Czech uh, companies. It includes the supply of uh, fighters for the Air Force of Philippines and Uruguay, weapons for Moldovan Armed Forces, propulsion units for the Indian Air Force, and uh, the repair and modernization of helicopters for um, North, North Macedonia. I see. And um, as, you, as you mentioned uh, earlier, Flavia, um, the Czech Republic is the first of these uh, countries in Central and Eastern Europe to set up an agency of this kind. But um, in itself this kind of method, this kind of mechanism, uh, isn't exactly new. So was the Czech Republic looking at other countries who've already established this kind of agency when it was setting up AMOS? It, this agency uh, was created based on other states' experience. Czech Republic kind of based on on their allies' experience, such as France, Israel, Sweden, the United States. Uh, these, these countries have well-established uh, defense export support agencies that perform a similar function to, um, to AMOS. In Central and Eastern Europe, there are some initiatives uh, regarding exports and defense exports, but uh, they do not perform the same tasks as the new Czech agency. Uh, there are, for example, export control agencies in Bulgaria and Hungary. Also, Romania has a department to supervise the quality of military products and service and the application of NATO and EU requirements. And uh, Latvia operates a um, database of export uh, business proposals, but this unit does not focus on defense. So in the case of... Uh, Central and Eastern Europe, this is a new initiative. Thank you very much, Flavia. And thank you again, Tim. For our listeners, if you would like to find out more about Shepard's daily defence news coverage, previous episodes of the podcast, video content and more, please visit our website shepherdmedia.com slash news. Coming up next... Flavia speaks to Dan Lindell, Director of Combat Vehicles and Platform Manager at BAE Systems Heglunds. Stay with us. Lockheed Martin to deliver target site systems for FMS To Australian KC. Honest Space Tactical Communications Portfolio. Even multiband terminal production continues with new eye. Through the noise of defense procurement with Shepard's Defense Insight. Save time identifying opportunities, mitigate risk, and get ahead of the competition with the most user friendly platform in the market. Head over to shepherdmedia.com slash demo to request your free demo and see firsthand how accurate integrated program and equipment data at your fingertips can get you ahead of the competition. 
As challenges on the battlefield continue to evolve, some European countries are running programs to meet new demands. One of those efforts is focused on the modernization of CV-9 armored vehicle fleets. Midlife upgrade programs are being carried out by Supplier Center, BA Systems, Aglandas, and are set to better prepare the CV-9 to face the tomorrow's battlefield. To take a close look at the upgrades and an insight on what this means for this specific platform, I'm joined today by Dan Lindo. He's Director Combat Vehicles at BA Systems Aglandas. Good afternoon, Dan, and welcome to the Weekly Defense Podcast. Thank you very much, Flavia. Thank you. Then some of the CV 9s in Europe have been serviced for decades. What would you say are the main advantages of upgrading this platform? Well, uh, the CV 90 has an inherent growth potential in it, which we have seen in several uh, in examples over the years. Uh, and but one of the foremost uh, advantages I would say is that there is a CV 90 user group that does uh, these upgrades where uh, not everybody has to invent the wheel every time. Some of the things have already been uh, developed, so you can actually get that for free. Uh, but also there's an inherent mobility in the CV-90, which is, which is um, still very relevant and perhaps even more relevant going into the future where territorial defense is of more importance than it was, say, five or ten years ago. And this says. What are the capabilities that uh, the operators want to to add to this vehicle? Well, uh, since there are many different generations of the CV-90, it's it's difficult to say a general uh, uh, thing that wants to be added. But almost everybody wants to have more sensors and actuators on the system. So upgrades to the electronic architecture is is uh, is very important. We're also looking into. Uh, the latest and greatest when it comes to uh, lethality uh, um, upgrades, uh, which is now being uh, included uh, in terms of ATGMs and so on. Uh, but I would say foremost sensors and actuators, actuators such as um, uh, hard kill systems and so on. And, and threats to, to armored platforms uh, continue to evolve. And in this sense, then, are these uh, upgraded CV-9 it's optimized to face the challenge of the battlefield of the future? Uh, not all of the future, of course. There will, <laughs> there will be necess a necessity for upgrades uh, also in the coming years, absolutely. But uh, the upgrades that are now being done, with, for, for, for instance, for uh, Switzerland or the, the, the Netherlands, Yes, they will certainly uh, be capable of, of protecting their countries for many years to come. Yeah, and you you spoke about the Switzerland and the Netherlands. Actually, the Dutch army will equip its CV-9 with an active uh, protection system, and Switzerland will improve the optical, electrical, and electronic components. But... Uh, how long can these extension programs keep the CV-9 in service? Uh, so actually, if you look uh, um, for the Dutch program, Dutch upgrade, it is uh, according to the original plan when they developed the platform in the in the, in the early 2000s. So it's it's a straight according to plan that somewhere around uh, 2020 they were supposed to have a midlife upgrade, and uh, so it's been in the plan from the beginning. So it's. Uh, and then, of course, how long it will prolong its life now and be uh, stay relevant, that's something for the Dutch army. Uh, you, you have to ask them. Uh, I have an idea, but it would be wrong of me to, to state that in a podcast. Okay. And uh, as a part uh, of a recent agreement with Clevister, the company is going to add cyber tech to, to protect the CV-90. They are actually adding the RSG400 and their RSW400. How do these systems contribute to the protection of this vehicle? Well, the RSG and the RSW400 uh, uh, devices, they're, they're designed to have an inter and intra domain security provide intra and, and, and intra domain security through uh, network uh, separation 
but also data segregation within those networks, uh, as well as access control, um, uh, network monitoring and anomaly detection. So we will actually see if somebody tampers with the system or not. So it's a big, uh, big part of the cybersecurity jigsaw puzzle that we're trying to lay now with, together with the Dutch. Uh, are there then other technologies, sensors, systems that can be added to this platform in the future, apart from the RSG400 and the RSW400? Uh, of course there is, and, and uh, both in terms of cybersecurity, but also in terms of other sensors and actuators that, want to, that we want to add to the system and that the customer wants to add to the system. And it's uh, something that we, we foresee uh, being uh, increased even more uh, in the years to come. So, yes. And in, in addition to the Netherlands and Switzerland, uh, Norway has also announced its intention to modernize its CV-9 fleet. Uh, but they say this is for to involve national companies in order to support uh, the defense industry to handle the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. Then is, is BA Systems currently working with national suppliers to upgrade the CV-9? Yes, uh, oh, uh, always <laughs> is my answer. So that's, that's, the, that's the way of working we've chosen many many years ago so all uh, all uh, countries were in including sweden actually we uh, we uh, we cooperate with uh, with the national uh, uh, companies and 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 as you mentioned uh, norway is talking about upgrading their systems but they just didn't upgrade and uh, uh, so we just delivered the last vehicle uh, uh, a year ago or so um but now they're talking about incremental upgrades. And what you're referring to uh, in the COVID is actually uh, converting more of their old vehicles into new, um, uh, new variants, uh, support variants. Uh, and that is almost all of that work is being conducted in Norway. So yes, that's, that's the, way, uh, the way we work uh, with, with the CV90 and, and, uh, and our countries, our customers. And that seven European countries are currently operating the CV-9. Does BA system expect to have more armies running life extension programs in the next coming years? Um, good question. And I have a very good answer. All of them. Well, this is good. Yes. <laughs> We're expecting all of the CV-9 uh, customers to to do upgrades to say to stay relevant uh, going into the future. And that is a... I think that is a, a um, testament of, of how well the CV90 system is working uh, uh, in in our user nations. That they keep investing into the system and into the club. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can answer this, but is BA system currently negotiating with a specific country? Yes. <laughs> now I don't want to go into details, but uh, there's no secret that uh, we're doing the work already now with the Swiss and, and the Dutch uh, and the Swedes. Uh, so uh, uh, you just look uh, look into, and I've already said the Norwegians. So and and actually, all of the all of the nations are are in uh, in different phases, but there we have discussions with all of them. Thank you very much, then, for joining us today. Sure, thank you. Hello, generic advertising company. Make it quick. Hi there, we've got some great news. Our R&D team has made a breakthrough and we need to spread the word throughout the defense community so those that influence buying know what they're missing out on. I've got a few print magazine ads you can have. It's going to cost you a pretty penny, though. Oh, I was hoping for something a bit more... modern? I need to be sure we're reaching a very specific audience. Do you want them or not? Discover the benefits of digital advertising with Shepherd. We work with you to understand your campaign objectives first, apply our 40 years of rich audience knowledge to help select an advertising product that works best for you. And when the campaign is over, we provide transparent reporting so that you can see the value of advertising with Shepherd for yourself. With higher than industry average click-through rates, you're buying more than just impressions when you buy with Shepherd. Looking to stand out? 
head over to www.shepherdmedia.com forward slash studio to request a free no obligation consultation where we'll discuss how to reach your intended audience with the most impact. Clevister and BA Systems Aglandas have recently signed a deal to add cybersecurity solutions into CV9 combat vehicles. These platforms will receive new capabilities under a midlife upgrade program. But why should armored vehicles feature cybersecurity systems? Join me today to answer this and other questions is John Vestberg. He's Clevister's CEO. Welcome, John, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. I would like to start by asking why should the CV9 feature cybersecurity capabilities? Absolutely. So vehicles in, in general and, and combat vehicles and CV90s are, of course, no exception. They, they have evolved incredibly over the past year. So it, it is really fair to say that today vehicles are literally data centers on wheels or in this specific case on, on tracks. <laughs> so the vehicles are equipped with numerous types of computers, IoT devices, communication systems, all of them interconnected using modern Ethernet IP networks. And as a consequence of this increased digitalization comes an increased concern of cyber threats. So to mitigate those threats, there has to be a high level of cybersecurity mechanism in, in the vehicles to ensure that all IT systems are shielded from both internal, but, but to some extent also from external threats or attacks. And also thinking about readiness and protection, uh, how can cybersecurity improve the readiness and the protection of the armies that operate this platform? I mean, in, 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 in the end, it's, it's really all about that all systems remain functional at, at all times. So if you would have a vulnerability in, in let's say, one of the critical systems, um, whether that's a, a camera system or, or, or uh, an engine control or, or whatever it might be. And if this vulnerability would be exploited during a mission, you can be faced with quite dramatic scenarios where parts of the vehicle stops functioning. And obviously that in turn can have really dramatic consequences for both the people operating the vehicle and, and of course the equipment. And I'm understanding it can have a huge impact uh, on the future. I mean, the the armed forces capabilities in the future. Uh, my question is, how can cybersecurity systems ensure superiority on tomorrow's battlefield? So, I mean, it, it's clearly a differentiating factor, both for the vendor of, of the actual vehicles, for the buyer, in, 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 in this case, an army, uh, to know that, you know, they have the capabilities in the vehicles to trust that, you know, the critical systems are not left unprotected. Um, so, so that comes as a differentiating, uh, differentiating factor, of course. But also for the users of the vehicles, it is an extra layer of safeguarding. So there, there, there adds an extra comfort knowing that the vehicle has the modern protection layers in place. So with, with all those factors together, it, it, it really takes the vehicles to a more superior level and therefore as well the, the actual users of them becoming more superior. And Caltrans and armies have been playing, paying uh, great attention to ongoing and future threats in the last few years. And uh, my, my question is, why cybersecurity on combat platforms has become a priority only now? You know, over the past years, it's been an increased um, digitalization, as as you know, um, and it's it's really only the 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 last I would say twelve eighteen months where the attention to this and the level of knowledge really surfaced to the level where. Um, the, the awareness is such that, that it's it's now forming part of technical requirements of the equipment and, and the vehicles as such. Okay, let's talk about the capabilities Clevster will embed to the CV9. Uh, there will be two systems, 
RSG400 and RSW400. Uh, John, what do these systems feature? Correct. So, so we have developed those two types of products. The, the first one, the RST 400, it's a security gateway type product. And what it really does is it, it provides network segmentation. It provides firewalling capabilities and authentication mechanism and, and authorization mechanism as well. So in essence, what it does really, it, it ensures that the various IT systems and the IoT devices in the vehicle are properly segmented from each other and that only approved and only authorized equipment can start and can communicate with, with each other and, and if need be with external equipment. One very practical example uh, of a threat and the way we mitigate that threat is if you imagine any equipment in a vehicle that could potentially be replaced by, by someone, uh, someone that you might or might not trust. It could be, an, an, let's say, a camera device. And as we all know today, cameras and other IoT uh, devices are extremely complex. They have a lot of software running in them. And sometimes it could be really hard to know and to trust that the software is authentic and that it contains no backdoors or contains no secret communication backdoors. So what we do with our product is to make sure that all those devices that are installed and tries to communicate have authentic footprints. They are authorized and they are, they are authenticated. The other product, the RSW400, is a secure switch product. It's, it's, it, it really has the same general purpose as the RSG400, but it provides a smaller subset of functionality. So you could view it as the, the, the smaller sibling in the same product family, really. And uh, are these systems interoperable? I mean, can they work together with other systems armed forces operate? Yes, they, they, they can. So... Both of, of those products, they are built and developed with compliance to all the modern communication and networking standards. So they are not limited to work in this specific combat vehicle. They, they can provide the same protection and work in more or less any type of vehicle. Clevis, the systems um, are being fitted into these vehicles uh, to enhance their security. But I understand that there are potential threats to, to the systems themselves. Uh, how, can, how can they overcome these threats? That's, that's, that's correct. Many, many security products and, and uh, firewall products are of course complex devices on their own and as such they they can be vulnerable especially if they are built on i would say standard types of operating systems and standard code platforms so what what clavister has done and, and this is the case not only for this specific vehicle product but also for our security products in general is that we have designed them ground up with a a, a very resilient way, extremely small footprint. We have implemented our own firmware. We're not basing the product on any standard operating system and so on. And as a consequence, that means that we have not only a small footprint, very low attack surface, and the entire product as a consequence becomes extremely ruggedized, not only with regards to the hardware, but to the software as well. So the, the likeliness or the, the ways of attacking our product are, are extremely limited in comparison to other products. And currently, the Netherlands and Switzerland, they are running life extension programs to keep the CV9 in service. Norway has also announced last year its intention to upgrade this platform. Uh, in addition, there are other four uh, European countries currently operating the CV9. -it. What do you say that other countries might uh, interest in adding your cybersecurity features to this platform? I mean, do, do you expect other countries embedding cyber tech into, the, into their, their CV9 fleet? 
So, so, so what we're picking up in in general from the market, of, of course, BAE is our customer, so we're not in a position to comment on their specific customers or, or countries. But what we pick up in general from the from the defense market is this, you know, overall growing awareness of cyber security threats, and and we're picking up interest from from you know multiple customers, multiple prospect customers as well. So it seems really to be a concern that has surfaced just over, you know, really over the past 12, 18 months and starts to become really a a key component in not not only defense vehicles, but also in in other types of vehicles, as I I mentioned earlier. As you said, it's a key component, uh, especially if we think about the tomorrow's battlefield and all the challenges they will bring for all types of platform. Uh, in addition to the CV9, it are your cybersecurity solutions suitable for other armored and combat vehicles? Absolutely. As as a matter of fact, both from the fact that we develop the products in in an interoperable way and in a generic way, but also as other types of vehicles as well. Other armored vehicles, of course, but also non-armored vehicles. Um, we we could look at other, you know mining vehicles, other type of industrial autonomous driving vehicles and so on. They all share the, the same um, commonalities with, with armored vehicles that they become so much increasingly complex with regards to, to technology. And, and we see increased demand from other customer groups as well. Okay, thank you very much, John, for joining us today. Thank you very much. You've been listening to another episode of the Weekly Defence Podcast. A big thanks to everyone who took the time to join us today. And for our listeners, if you enjoyed the show, make sure you like and subscribe or leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Shepherd Media is also offering a 20% discount for annual subscriptions to Premium News. Head on over to shepherdmedia.com slash subscribe and insert code PODCAST20 to redeem. Valid until 31st of March 2021. Until next week, thank you for listening.